Welcome back to Africa Speak. You know, I use that quote saying that uh, Africa must unite now or perish. That was said in 1963. Today we are in 2021. Are we united or are we perishing? That's a discussion for another day. Today, actually on the 16th day in office, U.S. President Joe Biden sent a video message to African leaders attending the 34th African Union Summit that promised American partnership and solidarity on a range of critical issues. The message was a welcome departure from former President Donald Trump's disparaging characterization of the continent. Given this promising start, few would have predicted that almost one year later, the Biden administration would make some policy decisions such as imposing an Omicron inspired travel ban on eight countries in South and Africa, withdrawal of benefits of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, majorly known as AGOA, from three other African countries, as well as growing criticism of a Biden administration's handling of the conflict in Ethiopia. And now to enter into our discussion today on Africa Speak. I'm joined by Professor Noah Midamba to discuss the Africa-USA relations. Prof, welcome to Africa Speak. I mean, looking at the way the continent deals with the United States of America, we, we see sort of a consistent democracy on their end where we have a democratic president, next we might have a republican president. But in Africa, that is not well defined in, in terms of uh, the economic policies that we, we, we profess as maybe as, a, as an administration. Mm -hmm. So looking, maybe may we just draw the difference. When you're dealing with a republican president uh, as a continent, what informs their decision when they're dealing with the continent of Africa? And now we are having a Democrat president. What informs their economic and, and their policy decision when dealing with an external factor like Africa? Thank you, Noah. Uh, but my, I'm Noah first and you are Noah second. It's okay. Um, <laughs> the, I'm speaking uh, at this point, Noah, having spent over 40 years in the United States. Um, I'm uh, also very involved uh, with political situation in the United States. I'm a Democrat uh, since 1980. Um, we need to sort of understand the cornerstone of what form American foreign policy. American foreign policy is formed by transparency, democracy, accountability, the rule of law, and also human right. That has formed the American foreign policy right from the beginning to where we are. Now, what separate Democrat and Republican? The challenge for Democrat is that there are too many cooks in the chicken. The Democrat tend to be between the middle of the ground politically to the extreme left. Mm -hmm. The Republican tend to be the middle of the ground to extreme right. So whichever the pendulum swing, Americans prefer to have the middle of the ground. And so you can see Biden and you can see Trump, uh, extreme right wing uh, to sort of middle ground to left leaning. And this is driven by the interest of both parties. Um, and it is the Republicans have been very successful in implementing their foreign policy because they tend to leave the president alone once the president is elected uh, to be bold enough to implement the policy. We're talking about the Nixon administration moving uh, in reapproaching China using Henry Kissinger mm -hmm. and now we have Chinese uh, American relationship which China has benefited a great deal over time. We're talking about in the democratic situation earlier on in the 60s Kennedy uh, took a very bold step with regard to the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and challenged them over Cuba 
And that was unlike a Democrat. Now, when you go back to the Republic and you're looking at Reagan administration, which really killed now the, the Soviet Union, as we know, mm -hmm. and reducing it to, to Russia. Now, for Africa, let's be very careful about a number of things. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of promises in the beginning. People like Kwame Nkrumah, Jamal Abdul Nasser, uh, Jomo Kenyatta. All these people were united with the hope that Africa will be a united continent. It didn't happen, Noah, mm -hmm. and I don't expect it to happen in our time because Africa has moved far apart. We are independent nations. Yes. We are not united Africa. Mm -hmm. And we are not closing, closing anywhere uh, to the sense of the African uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, China has uh, 1.4 billion people. Africa continent put together has 1.3 billion people. Africa continent is the most resourceful continent in the world right now and top resources in Africa, mm -hmm. which can make Africa the greatest continent in the world. Mm -hmm. But they have not been able to utilize our resources because we sort of sit back and say, United States, why can you can, come and help us? Mm -hmm. uh, China, why can you come and help us? All right. Now, China and United States is not going to help Africa for Africa. Mm -hmm. They are helping Africa for their own domestic and foreign policy. They will not change. They have national interest. That is the thing that Africa must understand now and forever. And it's quite interesting, Professor, when we see uh, just down south to our nation, Tanzania, when the late president, John Magufuli, uh, questioned the issue of mines in that particular country, yeah. the mining ecosystem, who owns that? Uh, can we have sort of, you know, ownership as a country in some of these resources? And you find a trail of thought heading all the way back to pre-independence. Some of the deals that we entered into are still haunting us today. Uh, and you've said the initiative should come from within the continent. But within the continent, are we empowered enough to influence policy, for example, for example, Kenya, and divided as we are in different states, are we able to influence policy in relation to the global powers like the Chinas and the USA? Um, very important point, Noah. Kenya must look for Kenya national interest in the middle of this wide ocean. And secondarily, the interest of Africa as a whole, because we need to trade with Africa. We need to talk to Africa. We need to exchange with Africa. There's a lot of potential interest in doing that. But let's not, let's not put our head under the sand and expect Tanzania, Ethiopia, Uganda, and all other countries to serve the best interest of Kenya. Mm -hmm. We must go for the best interest of Kenya by creating bilateral relationships. For instance, during the, uh, the Trump, I know we went back to uh, Clinton administration, which really set the agora going. Mm -hmm. Obama, President Obama, set up a four-point strategy for Africa, which is to take four countries in Africa and exemplify them in terms of relationship, such that the rest of Africa can learn uh, from these four countries a lesson. The four countries were Ghana, Egypt, mm -hmm. Kenya, and South Africa. It did not happen for two reasons. One is the democratic, uh, uh, as I said, the, the too many uh, uh, cooks in, cooks the, in kitchen. the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And they, all their interests sometimes collide with each other. And so they were fighting Obama. But primarily, Africa was never together. Africa went in in a meeting with Obama and everybody wanted their own pie. The Egypt want their pie, Nigeria want their pie, uh, South Africa want their pie, Kenya want their pie. Mm -hmm. And Obama could not get 
coherent, coherent policy that then will enable the Africa to grow. Mm -hmm. That problem continues right now. And basically, uh, Trump came in with a very orthodox, orthodox, but by, by the way, these are the secret talk behind the scene in America. Should we continue helping Africa or dipping our resources in a rat hole where we give them resources and they use it for their own personal goods, but not for the national good? Mm -hmm. And Biden, uh, no, uh, Trump was, uh, was an orthodox leader and he said things the way he feels, the way he is, mm -hmm. but he's telling Africa the truth. And therefore, Biden is going to try to then camouflage that and get back to the mainstream of American policy. Mm -hmm. The most important thing for Kenyans and for our citizens to listen is that America will continue to be the preeminent power now and for foreseeable future. American gross national product is roughly about $25 trillion. China is about $14 trillion. That's when you take America and the G7 combined together, it is an awesome power. And mind you, it is the economic power combined with the military power that bring dominance around the world. Yes. So China has grown very aggressively, but utilizing American resources to reach where it is. Mm -hmm. And Trump came and said, checkmate, this has to stop America fast. Mm -hmm. And you can see Biden continue that policy, and another president coming after Biden will continue that policy. Yeah. And so Kenya, um, and I'm talking uh, the interest of the country, must trade very carefully. While China has exemplified in infrastructure development, we should continue that in order to develop our infrastructure development. But we must change the goalpost. We must have control over the resources we borrow and how much and when in order to balance the situation with China. Mm -hmm. While China remained a great, critical partner because it's our biggest trade partner right now. Mm -hmm. And then go into a bilateral uh, trade arrangement with America and bilateral security arrangement with America that will help the, uh, uh, Kenya uh, now and into the future in a bigger way. For instance, look at the Israeli mm -hmm. and America. Look at England and America. Look at South Korea and America. Look at Taiwan and America. Mm -hmm. Those are the example of what we can do. Definitely. And even the Taiwan situation uh, we've seen with the rise of China also on, on the continent of Africa, some of recognition of you know, Taiwan as an independent state, uh, some countries in the interest, the economic interest. And this brings me you know, to, to the next point in regards to the choices that the continent has. Uh, you've mentioned about infrastructure. Africa is in that stage of building. Okay, and that has been our focus. Even when we look, when we do a, com a comparative analysis between the West and the East, we look, okay, we have a road here. Who's building this road? A Chinese const uh, co Construct. contractor, all right? We have a port, it's a Chinese contractor. Mm -hmm. Question is, when we look to the West and, you know, yearn for their involvement, we tend to expect Similar things. Come and build, but build better. Mm. Come and build and build cheaper. Come and build and build with sort of accountability, as you've said, are uh, the cornerstone of America's foreign policy. So shifting those goalposts, sir, how, how do we do that to, 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 to make sure that uh, we are having the Western involvement, but we are seeing the fruit of those involvement? No, here's the cornerstone. This is a very good pointed question which I want the citizen to understand. When you're dealing with America, number one goal is transparency. Number two goal is democracy and human right. 
In other words, there are going to be auditors coming from America to examine the investment they have done and report back to the Congress of the United States. Was there any discrepancy? Is there any dealing which is going to hinder the interest of the United States in the future in terms of this country and all that? Mm -hmm. Currently, you don't hear that about China. All the deals are almost secret. We are only understanding how much money we are borrowed, but we don't know how we borrow it. And we don't know who was involved in the process of negotiating and short-term, long-term interest. And so we must change that for the betterment of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it was uh, President Museveni that said one time that uh, because they don't have ability to extract the oil, let the oil stay under the ground until we have ability to extract it. Well, that is a very orthodox way of looking at development. But China is very cunning and very careful on how it's going to feed its 1.4 billion people and make sure that it, um, it encourages the development within China itself. China is working for the best interests of China. Mm -hmm. China, in the last 20 years or so, has been able to move, listen to this, 20 million people to the middle class. The only countries that was able to do that was Sing uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. not Taiwan, uh, was South Korea and Singapore. We cannot have a situation or economic system where the poor is getting poor and the rich is getting richer mm -hmm. and hoping that everything will be okay in the future. Yes. So we need to balance how much it is that we need to trade with China and in what area, mm -hmm. and vis-a-vis -vis United States and what area, yes. knowing that the U.S. will still remain the dominant power economically and militarily for the foreseeable future. Definitely. Uh, let's get into some numbers here, Professor. Uh, bilateral trade between the U.S. and uh, Africa as a continent uh, over the past decade, for, uh, from 2010, it stood at $113 billion. In 2020, right now, it's standing at $44 billion. That's a decade. Secondly, direct investment in Africa in 2014, from the U.S. to the continent of Africa, $69 billion. In 2020, $46 billion. There are other factors that we can attribute this, but overall when you look at the statistics, there is an element of this foreign direct investment and bilateral trade going down. Can we attribute that to either the continent of Africa finding more opportunities to do bilateral trades and different deals with other, other players in the, in the global ecosystem, or can we attribute that to the fact that maybe the, the U.S. has not been so keen when it comes to these two aspects, uh, investing in Africa being the end goal? Mm -hmm. Noah, you alluded uh, to two very important factors. One, the past administration, the U.S. past administration, were they keenly interested in Africa as a partner? And with a clear commitment to investing in Africa bilaterally? And the answer is no. Now, then you also alluded to China as you are talking. China was not in the equation when we were talking 20 years uh, earlier, mm -hmm. uh, 15 years earlier. China has been in the equation over the last 15 years and very aggressively mm. under, the, um, under the new chairman. Now, China find itself with trillions of dollars uh, and uh, uh, having had the ability to bring up 20 million people to the middle class and continue 
to work that way. And China was very comfortable because the relationship between the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and China was very strong. Mm -hmm. And China gained more from the U.S. than the U.S. gained from China. So I want our people to understand the fundamental of what this thing is all about. So that brought about the U.S. trade down as U.S. Uh, uh, primarily has always looked at the continent of Europe mm -hmm. as their f uh, foreign policy cornerstone and superficially look at Africa as coming up, but they have not invested in Africa. Mm -hmm. Now the time has now come for China to look at Africa and say, wait, wait, wait a minute, China is building all these bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, China is a multi-billion dollar investment in Africa, elsewhere. Why have we not done that? Mm -hmm. So Biden administration has a very specific major challenge now coming domestically and say, what is your African policy? Mm -hmm. And Biden has several challenges, fundamental challenges that is going to really uh, hinder his ability to be able to gain as much from Africa. Number one is uh, this um, using human right as the cornerstone, which has been the cornerstone of the U.S., but using it at the level where Biden has put it will hinder Biden's ability to implement his own policy. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, for instance, take the case of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a very important country in Africa. It's the second largest and it's been primarily one of the American friends in the continent of Africa. Ethiopia is involved with a very complex domestic problem, not outside, domestic problem. And instead of America understand what a level and calculation where they can come in and help Ethiopia, they create problem. Mm -hmm. They threaten to impose um, sanction mm -hmm. on Ethiopia but not understanding who is supplying Tigrinya with the army. Mm -hmm. And the, the level of Tigrinya commitment to overthrow Ethiopian government. Yes. They're not understanding that. Mm -hmm. And then they're coming so fast, they want to solve the problem today, and not looking at the midterm and the long-term situation. Mm -hmm. That hinder their ability to be able to help Ethiopia negotiate police. Yes. Another one is this Omicron. Uh, situation which just much there is problem in the world health problem in the world but know that America has invested in health problem in the world than any other country okay uh, including Kenya all right and therefore if you said we have target uh, three countries in Africa mm. and for for um, uh, uh, tra travel and everything okay. there is a reason Yes. For Tanzania didn't have policy mm -hmm. on uh, COVID-19 until recently and after the president died. You remember? Yes. And Kenya moved ahead with a very stringent uh, policy and developed a system which was reducing COVID incident. Yes. COVID is as bad as any, any, uh, any disease you can All right. see. And therefore, reducing it it's a national issue mm -hmm. and it's a national security mm -hmm. and it's a global policy. Yes, sir. Very important. I think we've touched on some key fundamentals, but such discussions, uh, Professor Noah, you said you're Noah one, so I'm Noah two, yes. uh, <laughs> needs a lot of time. We've just touched the tip of the iceberg. Thank Correct. you very much for offering you know, your input, which is very critical, understanding that you are a dual citizen, uh, USA, uh, Kenya, a Democrat, you said. Yes. And uh, from your commentary, I haven't seen, uh, you know, uh, being very partisan. It's been very well balanced, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Professor Noami Damba, Senior Associate, Global Center for Policy and Strategy, and Professor of Defense and Foreign Policy, uh, joining us right here on Africa Speak. But our time is up. What quote do I have to close the show? Well, today I don't have any quote. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Noki Kimbo. Up next, we have business today. Stay tuned.
Get the whole story.